Welcome to Mead Making 201. We're diving a little deeper into our mead making journey. Coming off of 101, you learned the basics of mead, what it is. Now we're gonna talk about the important things that come with making mead, especially when it comes to yeast and measuring specific gravities and other things like that. You might have seen this video before or say you've seen it because I did this one about four and a half years ago. I made Mead Making 201 and I am redoing it because I think I can deliver the content better. The content itself is the same, it's very good, the delivery was bad and here's an example of that. Uh, uh, um, just, um, the, uh, um, uh, series. I just had lots of, uh, ums and uncertainty in my words, and I want to redo this. So let's talk about our topics for today. We're talking a lot about measuring things, our yeast specifically, and nutrition, and halting fermentation. So topic one is all about hydrometers, their importance, measuring your alcohol content, how you do so, so on and so forth. Number two is your yeast, the information you need to know, especially about their alcohol by volume caps and how that relates to your mead making experience. Number three is halting fermentation. How do you stop yeast from fermenting or keep them from fermenting further? And the final one is yeast nutrition and when and how we add our yeast nutrient. So let's dive into topic number one, hydrometers and their importance. You'll see I'm reading off some notes. These notes are free to you. Down in the description, it's a Google draw, uh, Drive or a, a doc link, essentially. You can download them for free and uh, use them as you want. There's about six pages of notes here, so I'm not gonna go specifically into each one. If you're more visual, feel free to go ahead and download and read them. I'm gonna give you the short version slash the talking points of each one. So hydrometers, this is a hydrometer. This is one of the main ways that we measure your gravity or specific gravity of liquid. The specific gravity relates to the sugar content, generally speaking, found in whatever you're making, mead specifically in this situation. When you start mixing up your honey, your water, and your yeast, you will have a higher specific gravity than you will finish with. When you have these numbers at your disposal, you can figure out the alcohol by volume. There's another way you can do this that's not specific gravity. It's called bricks. On the side of a hydrometer, they often include the bricks scale, so we'll talk a little bit about that, but this is also a different tool. This is called a refractometer. It uses the bricks scale generally or specific gravity, and it's kind of nice. We'll talk about both here in a second. Let's say we've mixed together honey, water, yeast. We're gonna float our hydrometer in a tube, tall enough tube, tube, tube where it will uh, float. At that point, you can look at the side of the hydrometer and see where the number is landing. Most of the time, you're gonna see something like 1.060 and above. When you record that number, you're gonna use it later on, that is, you're gonna use it as your starting gravity or specific gravity. You can do the same thing when it comes to a refractometer. You get a small little amount of your liquid, you put it on here, put that on top and you look through and there is, it's kind of cool on the inside, there's a, a scale that you can see. We use this not only to help us figure out our ABV, but to also help us with later steps. So don't just think, well, I don't care about my alcohol content or knowing it, you're gonna use it for later steps. And it's a safety thing, actually, it's very helpful. We take the starting gravity of our brew. After fermentation is done and or slowed down, we're gonna take another gravity reading. This is gonna be different than the first one, hopefully. When you take that next gravity reading, it should be lower. Let's say we started at 1.080. After the fermentation occurs, we're at 1.000. This means, generally speaking, fermentation's done because you've consumed all the sugars you can consume because 1.000 is the same as water. And we know that most water doesn't have sugar in it, shouldn't have sugar in it. You can use some equations to figure out your alcohol content. So here is the specific gravity using those numbers, equation. I like using this one a lot because it's easier and uh, I can, I'm faster at it. You can also use an alcohol by volume calculator. I'll link to one and essentially you just throw in your numbers and it gives you the alcohol by volume 
number you need. There's also the bricks side. So after you go through your fermentation, you can do another gravity reading or another bricks reading using a refractometer or the side of the hydrometer with the bricks and throw it into this equation. It's a little more daunting in my opinion. You will be able to figure out your alcohol content there, but it is kind of busy. So I, I don't like to use that a lot. So that's how you figure out your alcohol content. You might be saying, why do I care about that? Well, it goes beyond just knowing the number. This also helps you know where your fermentation lies. Let's say this did not end at 1.000. I started at 1.080, specific gravity, and I finished at 1.020. If my yeast are able to ferment more sugars, or should have been able to ferment more sugars, I know that there's gonna be more fermentation. Now, a general rule of thumb is if the number stays there for a significant amount of time, let's say two weeks, it's probably done fermenting, assumedly. But if that number's ever changing, it means you have to be careful. Do not start bottling a brew that is not done fermenting. And the way you can know if something's truly done fermenting is with a hydrometer, taking multiple readings, figuring out is this level? Is this staying at the same number? Okay, it is, I'm good. We also use the hydrometer after we do things like back sweetening or anything like that to know what the next gravity is. So I highly recommend it. It's like a $10 tool that you will use for every brew. It will make you a better mead maker, I promise. Here's topic two, yeast alcohol by volume caps. A moment ago, I just alluded to the idea that yeast can continue the ferment. As yeast go along, they're doing their thing, they're converting sugar into alcohol, and then CO2, and doing that. All yeast have a cap of how much alcohol they can create. Now this cap is a little bit stretchable, meaning that if a yeast is really healthy, they can go past the point. If it's not healthy, they could go underneath. If you look at the information, for each yeast, it will say the alcohol by volume cap. Something like, let's say, um, the Lauven 71B going up to, I think, 14% ABV. This means that if you start your mead at a starting gravity that's gonna go above 14% when it finishes, there's a good chance that when the yeast hit 14%, they might just cap out and say, hey, I'm done, leaving residual sugar. Now this can also be stretched, like I said. If the yeast are happy and healthy, they might go past. They might go to 14.5%. They might go to 15 or above. It just depends on them themselves. But this is helpful to know when you are planning your meads and sweetness specifically. If you do not wanna worry about the later thing we're gonna talk about being stabilizing and pasteurizing, and you wanna make a sweet mead, generally speaking, you can take and cap out the yeast by putting so much honey into the brew that they literally can't consume it, that they just say, at some point, I'm out, I can't do this anymore. It does mean that you're gonna have a pretty high ABV brew, but that's a way to do it. That's something we'll talk about further along in the future, but again, a lot of this comes down to your hydrometer. If you have a hydrometer, you can know if your yeast have capped out, if that number stays at the same spot. Some yeast are really, high ABV tolerant, meaning they get up to like 18%. If you wanna cap out a yeast that's 18% ABV, you're gonna to have to put a lot of honey and you're gonna make something that's really boozy that needs a lot of time to rest. So that's a, a drawback of that. Knowing your tolerance will help you plan your meads as well. If you wanna make something that is 18%, you need to make it with a yeast that can handle up to 18% ABV. Otherwise, you'll be very sad when it doesn't hit that. Topic number three, how do we halt fermentation? I've reached a point in my fermentation where I want it to stop. Let's say, going back to my original idea, I started at 1.080 starting gravity, specific gravity, and I finished, finished, I am currently at 1.020. There aren't really any great ways to halt fermentation in its spot, meaning saying I'm freezing this in time. There are a couple methods like cold crashing that halt fermentation momentarily. That would basically mean you put it into a cold chamber, your yeast fall out of suspension, they go dormant for a time. But the moment they get back up to a temperature that they're comfortable, they're just gonna kick back up into fermentation. The only way to truly halt fermentation is to pasteurize. And that literally is boiling and killing the yeast with heat. Putting your liquid into containers, heating it with a sous vide, stove, something like that, 
to where the, the yeast literally die off. Now, there are some pasteurization times. You could do that here. But let's talk about the other alternatives. We're not trying to halt it currently where it's at. Let's pretend for a moment our yeast went from 1.080 to 1.000. If we want to back sweeten and ensure that there is no more fermentation on any sugars we put in there, we are going to either pasteurize, as we talked about, with those temperatures and ranges, or the stabilizing method, potassium sorbate and potassium metabisulfite in conjunction. When you use the stabilizers, the potassium sorbate essentially makes it to where the yeast can't reproduce anymore. They're done. They're, they're out. And the metabisulfite draws all the oxygen out. Metabisulfite is also known as Camden tablets if you need to use those. When you put them together, they halt future fermentation. Now, again, they, those don't work to halt fermentation that's active. It has to be a fermentation that's ended, and then you stabilize, and then you can add more sugar that's fermentable. After you've stabilized, you're safe to add whatever honey, you or fermentable sugar, I should say, that you want. Important note here, halting fermentation only occurs in two ways. If it's an active fermentation, it's pasteurizing. If it's a finished fermentation, it's either pasteurizing or taking and adding the stabilizers. Some people will talk about cold crashing as a way to do this. If you were to rack your mead a billion and a half times to get it off of the possible yeast, you will not have to use the stabilizers or the um, the pasteurizing method. However, any amount of yeast present in the brew still, when given more food, will start up the process of making more yeast and consuming the sugar content there. So cold crashing only works as a temporary notion for halting fermentation. Please remember that. I have a whole video on how to make a sweet bead that kind of talks about these steps as well with more depth. If you would like to find it, it's here, also in the description. We're on topic number four, yeast nutrition. One of the most important things to know about your yeast. Yeast are living creatures, they're just like us. They need food, they need the ability to uh, ferment healthily. It's just like a runner. I, I equate it, because I'm a runner, to like, if you're running a half marathon or a marathon, generally speaking, you're gonna take something to feed yourself as you go along the way. And that's just to give you more food to finish the race. Same thing, for yeast, we, they need to finish their race. Now, it kind of flexes a little bit. Yeast need less nutrition, the lower ABV you're at. They need more nutrition, the higher ABV, the more sugar content is in the brew. So let's talk about those things. What are your yeast nutrient options? You have plenty of them. They come in lots of forms, lots of brew shops, sell things like this online or in person. Stuff like Fermate O is an organic nitrogen source with complex micronutrients that help the yeast ferment as they go along. One little fun fact, Fermate O is basically just dead yeast. So yeast are cannibals. They consume their own kind, especially the dead kind. So they are consuming said nutrients within Fermate O and feeding on that. Fermade K is another option. Fermade K uses some micronutrients that are similar in uh, Fermade O. However, there is this thing called dimonium phosphate, or DAP as we call it. This is a literal straight up nitrogen source for yeast. It's just like shooting up nitrogen right into them. It is a very helpful thing for brews that need a lot of that, but one important note is dimonium phosphate does not get metabolized by the yeast after 9% ABV. So most people using Fermade K or dimonium phosphate, as we'll talk about in a second, do not include it after 9% ABV. And you're like, wait, how do I know that? Don't worry, I'll get there. The other option you have are stuff like dimonium phosphate, which is literally just the straight up nitrogen source, it comes in this crystal form, it's pretty cheap. It doesn't have the same micronutrients, so that's important to note. And the last one are yeast holes. You can take, boil uh, bread yeast or any yeast itself. Like we said, yeast are cannibals, they'll consume each other. So the yeast holes are literally just dead yeast. And so you can make some by putting them into a uh, glass with some water, boil that. Next thing you know, you've got yourself some yeast holes. They work as 
well, not as well as Fermate O or these other options, in my opinion. How do you add these things? You've got your options, what do I do? Well, we start with knowing how much to add. I have a great resource called Mead Tools that my buddy Larry has put together. Um, it's not me, it's not my source. It's something he's worked really hard on. There are a million calculators on there, including a yeast nutrient calculator. You plug in your starting gravity, which we've measured with our hydrometer, and assuming that the fermentation ends at 1.000, they're gonna tell you how much yeast nutrient to add for each one. It'll say on there, Fermate O, add 4.5 grams, or Fermate K, add this much, or DAP, or whatever, or combination, you could add a combo of the things. When do I add the nutrients that I now know um, the amount of? You can either add them up the front of the brew at the beginning. If your brew is low ABV, let's say you started at 1.060. Generally speaking, you can just go ahead and front load said nutrients, meaning fermentation, yeast, you pitch your yeast, you pitch your nutrients in the beginning, it'll rock and roll, be just fine. Once you get past that point, you're gonna want to stagger said nutrients, meaning you're going to break them into parts. Using your number from the calculator, break it into two, three, four parts maybe, and add them over the course of a couple days. You add a little bit on day zero when you started, then some on day two, then some on day four, then six, or however you want to do this. But you add food over time, just like our runner is eating his granola bar, as he's going along. He eats one at mile six, and then one at mile 12, and then one at mile 18 to give him more food. That's staggering the nutrition for our yeast. The reason we do that is because most high gravity, starting gravity brews need extra food for the yeast to be healthy. There's a lot of stress that happens in fermentation, and giving him that food really helps. There's a lot of data that says that the stagger nutrition schedule does a lot of good. I'm actually running a test currently to uh, see from my own experience how stagger nutrient stacks up to something that is maybe just front loaded. I have inconclusive data. There will be a video on that in the future. So that's topic four. We've talked a lot about yeast today. Starting gravities, we've talked about your hydrometers, how you uh, take care of that, your yeast information, alcohol caps, how you stabilize or pasteurize or halt fermentation, and finally, of course, your yeast nutrient. These are all important topics, and I hope that this is compounding to make you understand more about mead making. It's very important to know these things because they will make you better mead makers. They'll help you understand why things go wrong when they do, and they will go wrong in your mead making career. This has been 201. The original 201 video is gonna be erased from the planet, and that hurts, but you know, that's okay. Hopefully this one has been a better resource for you. I don't know if I'm gonna redo 301, mostly because I think I've figured out how to be a better teacher by that point, but maybe I'll redo 301. Thank you for watching. You can find 101, 201, 301, 401, 501, all in this uh, playlist somewhere. And I hope that you will click on those, to learn more about mead making. Let me know what you think below and I'll see you in the future. Fishing, eh? Bit of an holiday. Oh, it's very nice.